One of the greatest needs we have is to know and understand ourselves. Even with modern technology, we still fail to comprehend why we cannot control our emotions or willpower. In this teaching, my father, Dr. Lester Sumrall, will explain how each person is a triune being composed of body, soul, and spirit. These three components form the intricate workings of the human personality. Please stay tuned and enjoy today's lesson on the total man. One of the greatest needs of man is to know and understand himself. Man has made great strides in technology, yet he fails to comprehend why he cannot control his emotions or willpower. Every human should know that he is a triune personality, body, soul, and spirit. Dr. Sumrall has designed the Total Man Teaching Series to help you understand the intricate workings of your personality. In our home Bible colleges, our home Bible uh, teaching areas, of which we have many now throughout the nation, we tell them to take the teaching syllabus for the first 30 minutes, and then take the video for 30 minutes, and then questions and answers for 30 minutes, and then they have a 90-minute session that can't fail. It, ju it just can't fail. And uh, we need to do something similar to that in our larger teaching sessions uh, in our World Harvest Bible College here. We find that you don't really uh, have the subject just where you want it until your questions are answered. And if your questions are not answered, then it needs to be taught more. And that's the reason we, we uh, say, all right, we're ready. We're ready for your questions. And here are some of the questions that you have asked uh, tonight. It says, could you further explain, uh, through example, uh, the unrelaxed mind, the unrelaxed mind, a mind that is full of tension, screwed up, hurting, and, 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 and so tight until it can't, it can't, uh, it can't go to sleep, it, it can't talk on some other subject. Uh, that is an unrelaxed mind, and that it can get tighter and tighter until it snaps, and then, and then it's dangerous. Now, uh, businessmen, business ladies, or, or otherwise, I mean, in, in your home, you can get so keyed up in your mind until you don't know what to do. Our mind should remain flexible before the Lord. Our, our mind should be open before the Lord to flow in the spirit of the Lord. And we should never let anything depress our mind, you know, to take our mind and depress it and to make it sad. You know, there's some people sad that don't know why they're sad, and they can't get away from it. They, they, they go to bed sad, they wake up sad, they go to bed sad, they wake up sad. They're so sad. And, and you say, why are you sad? I don't know. Well, you see, they haven't been able to relax that mind to grab that thing and take it and take it out of it. Now, the, the ultimate to that is the, is the devil possessing a mind, and that's what you call demon possession. And then you've really got a mind that can't relax. And, and if you want to see mind like a thunderbolt, go to the insane asylum, stay in there for a while. And, brother, they got it. I mean, they got minds that won't relax. They scream all night at you, you see. And so that unrelaxed mind uh, uh, is a dangerous thing. You've got to teach your mind, and when it's time to relax, you relax it. And, and like I told you, when, when I leave my office, I refuse to bring the problems, the sorrows, the troubles of that office into my house. I won't have them there. They're not supposed to be there. I'm supposed to take care of those in that office, and I'm not supposed to take care of them, take care of them at my, at my dining room table. And so I don't sit at my dining room table and talk to my wife about all the problems coming to my office, because what, you wouldn't have any home then. All, all, all you'd have is both of you as so keyed up until your food wouldn't digest. And I just refuse to permit it. I keep my mind relaxed and free, and I keep it happy, and I keep it rejoicing in God. And, and I have control of it. You don't have to ask God to do it. God wants you to do it. And so it's our own responsibility to keep our minds what we want them to be. Now, when Smith Wigglesworth says, I, I don't ever ask Smith Wigglesworth how he feels, that means he had a disciplined mind, you see. That means he had a relaxed mind. And, and, because, and that meant he had a control mind. He was, he was controlling that mind. Now, you control other parts of your being. And you, you've got to control your mind, too. And if you don't, it'll control you. And if it's under the Adamic nature, it'll always think wrong and do wrong. But under the, under the Christian spirit, it'll do right. And it'll think right. And it'll say right things, simply because uh, you have disciplined it to do so through the new birth. And, and so uh, 
it is very necessary that we learn to completely relax the human mind. Just, if you kept your body like this, you'd just fall over dead, uh, you know? You, you, you could just stay that way so long and you'd, you'd be gone. And, and your mind's the same. Your mind just cannot get strained and just stay that way. Uh, it, it can reach up to a, a peak of, of doing something, then it backs off back down and, and completely and completely relaxes. The second question that you asked was, what does the mind do in repentance? Your, your total solical parts uh, has a part in your repentance. Uh, your, your willpower has to say, not my will, but thine be done. So it gets in there. And your emotional power is coming in there strong. Now, I want to say something very strong about it. And that is, uh, people have a lot of trouble with anger. And, and they let anger overcome them and they start screaming. And, and, uh, and some of them even lose their mental balance because they've screamed so loud and so long until they, they can't think anymore. And, and that's your emotions taking over the, the other dimension uh, of, your, of your mind, which is certainly uh, a wrong thing. Now, if it ever happens, don't, uh, don't just quit and give up and say, I'm not saved. Uh, but stop for a moment and say, now, wait a minute here. Uh, my emotions are under, under God's divine control, and I am not supposed to be like a sea, a troubled sea with waves. I am supposed to live like this, and my emotions are supposed to live like this. I am supposed to have the same amount of happiness every day, the same amount of peace every day, the same amount of joy every day. I'm supposed to be like God every day, you see? And, and you're just supposed uh, to be that way. And in your, in, in, your, in your total being, when you're saved, you give your mind over to Jesus, you give your emotions over to Jesus, you give your will over to Jesus, and when you do, he comes in and he gives you a new spirit inside of you, which is your relationship with God. Uh, your spirit is your born-again nature. It's your Romans 14, 17. God's kingdom, which is in you, is God's righteousness, the blood of Jesus, God's peace, and God's joy. And you bring that into your mind. And then you bring that into your emotions, and you bring that into your will, and your mind, your emotions, your will becomes a servant to the king of your life, which is your spirit. And, and, and when that happens, then you're living the spiritual life that God wants you to, to live. So your mind has a very important part, and you're surrendered to God. And you're saying, now I'm going to go the God way, and I'm not, my mind will no longer tell me what to do. My spirit will tell me what to do, and my mind will obey it and carry it out. In your next question, it says, does fasting discipline the mind and cause our thoughts to be centralized somewhat? It most certainly does. Uh, almost every great thing I've ever done had, had some relationship to fasting, either one meal, two meals, five meals, ten meals, or whatnot. Now, uh, and sometimes it's unconscious. This girl in the Philippines, when I heard at 10 o'clock at night of her demon possession, I didn't eat or drink anymore that night. I went in the front room, I laid on the floor, and I prayed all night. I did not eat any breakfast. I got in my car and went to the mayor's office. I did not eat any lunch. I came back home, and I laid on the floor. I did not eat any supper. I laid on the floor. I did not go to bed that night. I laid on the floor all night and prayed unto God. I went back the next morning and cast that thing out of her, out of her. And then I went back home, laid on the floor all that day, and, and didn't eat. And that night, I didn't sleep. And the next morning, I don't tell people about it very often. I, I didn't feel human. I felt as if when I went out to the car, I didn't know whether I should drive it or not. I felt as if I could step over it as easy as I could step in it. And, and that's a kind of a strange feeling. And that's what they call high on drugs. And, and, and uh, I see a human, but he didn't look big. He, he looked about this big. And, and uh, I had to look down at all the humans. And it was, a, it was a phenomenon. You see, I had gotten into a relationship with God that was uh, further than, you know, just regular living. And when I got out of that prison, I, I just made everybody obey me. When all those newspaper reporters were there, I said, get on your knees. And every one of them got on their knees. I mean, like sacks of cement, like that. They, they, they obeyed. The doctors obeyed. The devils obeyed. And, and uh, I, I'll tell you, maybe I shouldn't. Uh, the, the newspapers were putting out big pictures and big stories, and I didn't want to be around them. And, and so I got in my car with my family, and we drove to Boggill. And that's a way up a mile, a mile high in the mountains. And I decided to play golf. And after four holes, I quit. I'd never played golf like that before. I was going in the hole in two rather than four. When I got through the fourth hole, I looked at the friend I was, I was playing with, and he had played with me many times before. I said, I'm quitting. 
He said, I would too if I were you. <laughs> yeah. It, it, that, that, that thing was in my swing, you know? And, and he was almost afraid of me. He, he was afraid of my face. It, it took a number of hours for that thing to recede back that I had gotten into through God. Now, we don't often tell people things like that, uh, that, uh, that the human person can draw, can draw close to God for certain things. And, and, and I'm sure that when Moses came down from that mountain and his face was shining, that it took a few days or maybe a few weeks for him to move back into the original Moses until he was like the people around about him. There are places in God that are very sacred and, and that uh, people that have gotten into them and don't even like to talk about them. I mean, they, they would prefer not to talk about them for the simple reason they're, they're very sacred and unbelievable. I mean, they're unbelievable from the person that they happen to, much less people that they didn't happen to. And, but uh, there, are, there are places in God that are very sweet. There are places in God that are very beautiful. And, uh, and if God wants you into those places, move into them in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. But fasting has a lot to do with the mind and with the body and in what is called here centralized thought and conforming yourself into the thinking like God wants you to think. The next question is, if the mind or soul is fed more than the spirit, can the mind overpower the spirit? There are many Christians living by the power of their soul. Now, there are some great Christians that are doing unusual things in the earth today, what they're doing is a solical situation. And even though they're fine Christians, they're making decisions in their soul. Now, you see, God's not going to make you live in the Spirit. And that's what some people can't get over. They want God to beat them down like a dog every morning. And God's not going to do that to you. They want to, they, you want God to treat you like you treat a little kid. Don't, yeah, don't, 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 don't. God don't say don't all day, you know. God may just say it one time and never say it again. And then you've got to don't after that without him saying it anymore. And, and so we must learn to, to know uh, this, that uh, God will not subject you to something that you don't want to do. You've got to want to do it. And God will then anoint you to do it. If you know it, say amen. amen. So the soul or the mind uh, can become strong and, uh, and persistent until it overrides the spirit, overrides the spirit, and overpowers the spirit, and that you're not living in your spirit, you're living in your soul. Now, I think you've heard me say, and I, I presume I could say it again, that it's very possible that way up there, 75 to 85 percent of all Christians live in their souls. But they do it in ignorance. They don't know what their spirit and soul is. Most Christians on the face of this earth, you're, you're a, a very small minority of people. You could go to any large church in this country today and ask people who knows what their spirit and soul is, and there won't be, there won't be 1% of the people that know what their spirit and soul is. So just because you know what it is, I don't want you to think that everybody knows it because you do. They don't know it yet. And, and when I go over the country, one of the first things I do is teach them the difference between their spirit and their soul. Because if you don't, for sure you're going to live in your soul. You know, you'll always take the lower road, just automatically take the lower road, and you'll be living in your mind, in your emotions, and your will. Every divorce in this country is a solical thing, every one of them. And look at the Christians that are involved in that today. Millions of them. And you know they justify themselves? I tell you, I was treated this way. You see, that's your soul and your mind functioning right there, you see. And, 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 and I wasn't treated right, I. Well, that's the reason the devil got cast out of heaven using I too much. It is possible when there's a bad situation in a family to fast and pray and believe God and change a thing through the power, through the power of prayer. My, my mother had a real right to a divorce, a real right to it. I don't think it ever passed through her mind even remotely, even remotely, even remotely anywhere, even remotely at all. She just says, well, I'm going to get that rascal saved somewhere or another. Yes, keep on waiting on God and he saves him. Just, just get him saved. Just get him saved. And she would travail in prayer until God saved him, you see. And, and, and we're taking the way of least resistance, and that's solical. You see, that is solical. Uh, in, in, our, in our generation, the thing that needs to be taught almost more than anything else is to live in your spirit and not your soul. Uh, it's so easy to live in your Adamic nature, e even with your emotions 
screaming and yelling and having your way, or in your bodies, eating everything you want to, going everywhere you want to go, satisfying your body. And God wants us to live by our spirits. If you know it, say amen. amen. In demon possession, does the demon have possession only of the mind? No, in demon possession, the devil has a hold of all of you. Of all of you. Uh, Brother T.L. Osmond was telling me, and he, he, I think it may, might have been on the, on the television, that in the countries where he's visited where they don't have insane asylums, uh, that they, they, they take the insane people and shackle them. And he said he's seen dozens of them that have heavy shackles on, on their arms and on their feet. Now, they haven't broken any laws. They're just crazy. And, and uh, they bite and they scratch and, and they hit uh, uh, people and they, they're crazy. And so they shackle them. And he told of how many he had seen that were shackled down with irons on their hands and feet. But God gave them a new mind and those things could be taken off of them. And how, how beautiful it is when God sets the mind, the mind free by his mighty power. But when the devil possesses a person, he takes over the body, disfigures the body, the eyes don't look right, the mind can't think right, the face isn't, the face isn't right, it's, it's, the, the, the strangeness in it, and, 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 and the body contorts, uh, it is not right. And so when the devil takes over in a full uh, demon possession, it's for the total person. It's not for just a part of that person. Your next question, regarding the empty and passive mind, how can one trust the Lord to reveal his will in the area of life, in the area of life work, without having an empty or passive mind? Well, honey, fill it with a word. Begin right there. Fill your mind with the word. And, and fill your mind with constructive, constructive thinking. Uh, There's so many things to study about. Uh, we live in a world today that's so full of, uh, of interesting studies. I, I'll give you one of them. Why don't you study the life story of the, of the ten greatest missionaries that ever went to the foreign field? You know, ten years from now, you'll come up with a book. Hudson Taylor. He was a full gospel man. You know why they called him in China? They called him the devil chaser. Yeah. That's what they call Hudson Taylor, the devil chaser. When he went into town, he cast evil spirits out of people and set them free. Uh, he was a great denominational man, and at that time the full gospel people weren't even known. But even at that time, they called him the devil chaser. Uh, there are so many things to learn in this world, but one thing I don't want you to do, and I don't want you to read fiction. I hate fiction. You say, oh, it's a beautiful story. It's beautiful rubbish. You say, why? I don't believe in anything that's not real. And if a thing's not real, I quit right there. At the point of unreality, I back out. I said, why should I read that? That didn't... Man, talk about love stories. Read the Bible for them. Read, read Ruth. Man, that's a great one. Any gal that can go out and pick up corn and get a husband, she's a smart girl. <laughs> you better believe it. You better believe it, you see. And, and so there's so much truth in, in, involved in the world that you don't have to read nonsense and, and lies. Read the history of the Christian church of the martyrs. I've got Fox's book of martyrs in my office. It's about that thick. Only covers maybe a hundred years of the people that died for Jesus. Brother, you'll cry your eyeballs out. And you'll never be the same to think of the people that were burned with fire. Their heads were cut off just because they loved the Lord Jesus Christ and would not deny what Jesus had done for them. So your areas of occupation are, are so many. Don't look for them. And so... You never need that. There's no need of an empty mind. There's no need of an empty mind. Uh, put it to work knowing the things of the Lord and, uh, and, and let us have the things of the Lord. Can you say amen? amen? The next question says, in reverence to John uh, 3 and 5, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Can you walk in the Spirit without water baptism, and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is it true that without water baptism, you cannot enter the kingdom of God? The thief on the cross got in. He got in without water and without anything else. Now, what God loves is submission. Now, water baptism really is just submission. That's all it is. That's what it is. 
Water baptism is for you to reveal in an outward way what God has done in an inward experience. Now, we say we have died to sin, so you go into the waters of baptism to die. And they take you there and plant you. You're all gone. It's all even on top. Nobody there. And then suddenly, you, you reappear. Up from the grave, you come. And you come up from the grave, and you come up saying, Hallelujah. So you're a different one than when you went down. You went down scared and came up happy. If you have an opportunity of water baptism, and you don't get water baptized, then, then you have rebelled. You have rebelled against God. Now, rebellion is wrong. And, and if you rebel against God, then you're wrong. You can be saved on your deathbed, and you'll go to heaven for sure. But if you're going to live a few years, and you say, I don't want water baptism, Jesus did in order to perform all righteousness to show the death of the natural man and the rise of the spiritual man. And in Romans 6, they that are baptized with him in water baptism shall rise with him in resurrection. And so we must do it. Now, the latter part of your question, is it true that without water baptism, you, can't, you see, that is not true. The little babies go into heaven without any water baptism, and the, the Bible says they are there, so we know that they are there. And, but if you don't have, in a spirit of rebellion, you may not go to heaven, but it wouldn't be just water baptism. It would be another thousand things you weren't doing too, you know, because rebellion is rebellion, point blank. Yeah. Aren't you glad Jesus loves us? Amen. I am so glad Jesus loves us. The question says, in 6,000 years, yeah, he got ugly. <laughs> Has he changed in size? Uh, not much. Not much. When we look back through the Word of God and measure what they did, the remains that we find, uh, for example, when I go to Egypt, I usually get all upset. I say, there's nobody here as pretty as the pharaohs. You know, they bring out these pharaohs, and they've got such beautiful faces, you know, and such a beautiful nose. And I said, it's a funny to me that there's another Egyptian over here. It looks like a pharaoh. Where did they all go to? And, and so I don't want to hurt you. We haven't gotten better looking. And, 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 and there is no evolution in process. It's devolution all the way. And so when we get into our immortal bodies, we're going to go back to the Garden of Eden and be pretty and lovely. However, our noses are still there, and our two eyes are still there, and our teeth are still here, and our shoulders are still there, and so there's a real similarity to Adam himself. How many believe that? There's a real similarity to Adam himself. And, uh, and, and I thank God for that. Can you say amen? amen? Now, the end of the question here said, was this changed through chemistry of diets, environment, and so forth? Now, man has changed in, in, in some areas. Uh, there's a lot to know when we get to heaven. We've got to stay busy up there, aren't we? I'll ask God, why did the Chinese eyes go out a little further than mine this way, you know? And I'll, I'll, I'll ask him why one man was black, and yet his blood was the same. You see, if, if you were, if you were, if, if this black brother back there was knocked down and hit with an automobile, your blood would save him tonight, you see. Uh, and if it was the other way, his blood would. So the blood is the same. It, it's only the skin that got changed. And I don't know how it all happened. And I don't think the Bible shows you all what happened. And I don't know why... Uh, one race looks a little different from, the, from another race. And I don't know which is the original one. Yeah. Some of you got washed out some way or another. <laughs> and I, I know that over in Indonesia, they told me that God was trying to make a man, and he made the, 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 the first one, and he wasn't paying good attention, and he burned him. <laughs> Went back, made another one. He got nervous about pulling him out, and, and he didn't get toasted enough. And he says, finally, he made the third one, and he made an Indonesian, real pretty. Well, you see, that's his idea about it. That's his idea about it. But one day, we're going to get God's idea. One thing we know, we're all the children of God. Amen. And we're all the seed of Adam. And, and we're all going to be real pretty, just like Jesus one day. 
What is the greatest ability of the Spirit? Is the greatest ability of the Spirit to pray or to worship? Uh, Jesus said that when you pray, ask and you shall receive. And then he said, seek and you shall find. And knock and it shall be opened unto you. Asking is your lowest form of prayer. A seeking, which takes intelligence and is solical, is your second greatest form of prayer. Knocking and it being open to you is your third form of prayer, which is worship. So the greatest thing that any of us could do is to worship God. That is the number one thing that any person could do. But your prayer, you see, could be worship. And so maybe what we should say here, rather than is it prayer or worship, we could say is it work or worship? Now, does God want me to work for Him or worship Him? God wants me to worship Him first and work for Him second. And my worship of Him is more important than my working for Him. You know, some of those fellows, like, like, like Abraham, he didn't do much soul winning. You still here? But man, he sure walked with God. He sure worshiped God. And so it's very important in the first instant is to know that you love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all your being. And then that we worship the Lord. After that, we, we, we work for Him. But the, the greatest thing that the spirit of a human being can do is to have a proper relationship with God in worship. And that will straighten out a lot of other things in our lives. Can you say amen to that? It can make a lot of other things work right uh, when we have a time of, of beautiful worship. I want to thank you uh, for your questions that you sent in. I, I hope that we're able to uh, answer them uh, satisfactorily. When you've never seen a question and you have no preparation for it, uh, sometimes it's uh, rather easy to uh, not know exactly how, how to answer it. But we hope that, they, that these answers will at least help you to get started on finding an answer. May I bless you. Father, we want to say thank you uh, for knowing and, and learning. And we want to thank you for blessing. And we ask you to bless us as we learn and know. And we ask that you will help each one of us to serve the Lord our God with all our hearts. And thank you for all these great truths. The message you have just heard is now available in audio and video. An audio tape is yours for a gift of any amount and a videotape for a gift of $20 or more. Please mention the program number on the screen when you communicate with us by either phone or mail. I am Peter Summerall, and thanks for watching.